A little boy wanted a hundred dollars so badly he prayed for two weeks, but nothing happened. So he decided to write God a letter asking for the money. When the postal authorities received the letter addressed to God, USA, they decided to send it to the president. He was so impressed, touched, and amused that he instructed his secretary to send the boy a $5 bill. The little boy was delighted with the $5 and sat down to write a thank you note to God, which read, Dear God, thank you very much for sending me the money. However, I noticed that for some reason you had it sent through you or to you through Washington, D.C. And as usual, those guys deducted $95. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I hope you have your Bible handy. We'll be uh, turning to the scriptures. And obviously a lot of things are happening in this world of ours. And it appears that maybe Syria will attack Israel in this next month. Uh, there's a troop buildup. Also they're asking their people to withdraw out of Lebanon and and uh, China has even sided with Syria saying that uh, they would help them in getting the Golan Heights back. Interesting things are happening. We also find out that there is a troop built up on the Iraqi border from Turkey. 140,000 Turkish troops and battle groups are lined up on the border there as they want to cross over and fight against the Kurds. And uh, numerous other things are happening. Weapons are flowing into the Gaza just like water, and uh, obviously that's becoming a military arsenal, and Israel is being more surrounded every day. It's interesting. We're living in some very interesting times. The Pope this week declared the primacy of the Roman Catholic Church, saying that they're the only true church, and every other church is defective or false, that there's only one true church on the planet, the Roman Catholic Church. I've been asked several times about that this week. Of course, the Pope is wrong and the Bible is right. You know, it's interesting that the Roman Catholics make this big point because that allows them control, and I think you need to know the answer, and so I'm going to take a couple of minutes this morning to talk about that. If you'll open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 16. We find as you get to chapter 16 of the book of Acts, rather the book of Romans, I'm <laughs> not even the right book here, the book of Matthew, I'm backing up here, I think. Uh, but anyway, Matthew chapter 16, Christ is uh, pretty much rejected by Israel. And you see incident after incident where the Jewish people reject Christ and his claims. And then we have chapter 16 where Jesus here uh, tells them how that they were obviously missing the most important event that would ever happen in their lifetime. Notice, if you will, verse 1 of chapter 16 of Matthew. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees, two major religious groups at the time of Christ, tempting Christ, desiring that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites! You can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? Notice apparently we've had weathermen from the beginning of time. And apparently the weathermen don't always get it right. We know that from the time of Noah. How many weathermen reported a flood coming? Uh, I don't remember any of them doing that. In fact, nobody believed the flood was coming as Noah preached for 120 years that there was a flood coming and built the ark, and yet the flood did come. But in any case here, he told them that they were pretty smart. They could figure out short-term weather forecasting by looking at the sky. But then he says here, you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. You know, he's talking here about the message of the gospel there in the Old Testament, the story of Jonah is one of the most wonderful stories 
that gives us the story of the gospel. You remember Jonah was a runaway missionary, running away from what God wanted him to do, and he was on board a ship headed as far as he could possibly go from Nineveh, which is where God wanted him to go. And we find that God brought a great storm on the sea. And the storm uh, was endangering the lives of all those on shipboard. And those men tried everything to save the ship. They lightened the load. They dropped the sails. They rowed hard. They prayed to whatever heathen God they knew. But nothing worked. Because that's what religion is all about. It can't work. It won't save. You can choose any religion you want and wind up in hell. It turned out, Jonah told them, that in order for them to be spared, they'd have to cast him overboard. He was a type of Christ. And when Jonah drowned, he died, in case you didn't know. Then the storm was calm, and the people on board the ship were saved. It cost Jonah his life. And then we know that he uh, went down to the heart of the earth for 72 hours. His body was entombed in the fish's belly for 72 hours, Jonah 1.17. And then God raised him from the dead, and he re-entered the body in the fish's belly, and the fish vomited him out on shore, and he went on to Nineveh and preached in a body that had died and come back again from the dead. He was a sign to the people of Nineveh, and as a result, they believed his preaching. You can imagine what Jonah must have looked like after his body was in that fish's belly for three days. That fish was trying to digest Jonah. And we know there are stomach acids in your stomach and mine, and I'm sure in that fish's belly. And it tried to digest Jonah. So I would imagine that he was bleached out, that his skin was thoroughly wrinkled. I would imagine all the hair on his body had uh, been uh, eaten off by the stomach acid. So that would mean he'd have no hair on his head, no eyelashes, no eyebrows, no facial hair, no hair anywhere on his body. Can you imagine what a freak he looked like when he entered Nineveh? And obviously he bore the marks of his death and his resurrection in his body. And so Christ said, that's the sign I'm leaving with you. And of course when Christ died and then was buried for 72 hours, Christ also went into the heart of the earth for 72 hours and came back from the dead in that same body. He bore the marks of his death in that resurrection body, didn't he? Immediately when he saw his disciples, he showed them his hands and his feet. And he showed them the wounds that had been inflicted upon him. They knew this had to be the Lord come back from the dead. Well, in any case, he warned the disciples now of the false doctrines of the religious leaders of his time. Notice, Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes. And they totally missed the meaning. It went whoosh, right over their heads. And we find here that he had to explain that to them a little bit later. We're going to jump all the way to verse 11. And he says, How is it that you do not understand that I spake to you not concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of what? The doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He was warning them about the false teachings of the religious leaders of his time. And so they were to watch out for that leaven. And obviously leaven, when you use it in making bread, it permeates the whole loaf, doesn't it? A little leaven, the Bible says, leaveneth the whole loaf. La, loaf, And so just a little bit will create an evil, a corruption that corrupts the whole thing. And oftentimes that is what happens when false doctrine creeps into a church. Well, in any case, he leaves the Jewish population and he moves to northern Israel. We were there in March and those that were on the trip with me uh, remember, I'm sure, here we stood at the one of the sources of the Jordan River and we saw the river or the waters flow right out of the base of the mountain and form several tributaries that became the Jordan that flows down into the Sea of Galilee. And it says in verse 13, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, 
This is a Gentile city. And Christ is now going to announce the church age, which had never been announced prior to this, but now he's going to announce the church age where God would pretty much turn to the Gentiles over this past 2,000 years. And he makes the announcement in a Gentile city. Notice the city is named after Philippi, or Philip, Caesarea, Philippi, speaking of the Caesar of Rome. And this is one of the ten Roman cities called the Decapolis. And he asked his disciples in this Gentile city, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elias or Elijah. Others say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answers and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Great answer. Peter gets an A on that answer. Christ is obviously the Messiah. The word Christ is equivalent to the Hebrew word for Messiah. And he's the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is God who took on flesh. In verse 17, we find it says, And Jesus answered and said to Simon, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You know, God chose to reveal himself, and he did it by revealing himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And if Christ or God had not wanted to be found, we would have never found him. God really is a spirit and cannot be seen. But God chose to reveal himself to us and describe his person, his character, his love. And he did that by becoming a human being and becoming one of us. And here we find that Peter is told that that revelation was really from God, that God came to reveal himself in the person of Christ. And then in verse 18 he says, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now this verse is used by the Roman Catholic Church as their main platform for everything they say and do. They say that Peter is the rock upon which the church is built. That is not correct. That is not what the Bible is saying. And let me point out, if you have a Schofield, why so it's so valuable. I'm going to read from the footnote at the bottom. And if you have a Schofield in your hand, which is what we loan out in the pew, please notice this valuable note. It says, there is in the Greek. Now, you have to remember, the New Testament was written in the Greek language. And it says here, there is a play in the Greek upon the words. Thou art Peter. The word for Peter there is the Greek word petros, which means literally a little rock. Then it says, and upon this rock, the Greek word is petra, which means a solid stone or a huge rock. It says, I will build my church. Notice Schofield's comment. He does not promise to build his church upon Peter, but upon himself, as Peter himself is careful to tell us. So we find here that he's really saying that you're a little stone, Peter, and you're one of the little stones that will be a part of the construction of the building, which is the temple of God, the true body of Christ, the church. But I'm really building the church upon myself, that I am the rock. Well, guess what? Peter had many opportunities to make that claim for himself, but he never does. He always explains that Jesus Christ is that rock. Let's go to Acts chapter 4, and here's one of those times when Peter is preaching, and look at what he says on page 1153, if you have a Schofield Bible, in Acts 4, verse 10, Peter is now being examined as to how this impotent man was healed that they healed here in Jerusalem. And Peter gives the answer in verse 10 of chapter 4 of Acts, page 1153. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, notice the identifying clause here, whom you crucified. Then he says, whom God raised from the dead. There's no question about who we're talking about. We're talking about the Jesus that was crucified, the Jesus that God raised from the dead. It says here, even by him doth this man stand here 
before you hold. If you want to know how the man was healed, it was by the name or the power or the authority of Jesus, the one that you crucified, the one that God raised from the dead. And verse 11, he says, this is the stone. If you're marking your Bible, Peter is telling us that Jesus is the stone, not himself. He could have said, it was in the power of my name, Peter, and that I'm the stone, and the church is built upon me, but he doesn't. He says, it's by the name of Jesus, the one that you crucified, the one whom God raised from the dead. This is the stone which is set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Look at what Peter says in verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. Other than whom? Jesus. For there is none other name. Not Peter, but Jesus. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we, what? Must be saved. Is it clear or is it clear? Peter says Jesus is the stone. He's the one that was rejected by you, the builders, and has become the head of the corner. He's the one that is the one responsible for raising this man up and making him hold. He is the one in whom there is salvation, not me, nor in someone else. We find it's clear. Let's turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 3, page 1214. Here Paul gives us an incredible statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, page 1214. Notice verse 11. Peter says, or rather Paul says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Peter. No, I misread that on purpose. Notice, if you will, 1 Corinthians 3.11, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Who's the foundation? Christ. And there is no other foundation, it says in verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So there is no other possibilities, no other options. Peter is not an option. And here we have Paul telling us that the foundation is Christ. Turn, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 2. And here we have Paul writing in his letter to the Ephesians. Look at what he says. In verse 20 of Ephesians 2, page 1251, I hope you're writing these verses down. It says that we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself, Ephesians 2.20, page 1251. Jesus Christ himself being what? The chief cornerstone. Who is the chief cornerstone? Jesus Christ. It's very plain that we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, but the foundation stone, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone is none other than Jesus Christ, as Paul says here, himself. Jesus himself is the rock. He's the one upon whom the church is built. Let me just pause before I go any further and tell you the Roman Catholic, Catholic Church claims apostolic authority passed on from Peter to each of the popes and that the church was built upon Peter and that these people that succeeded Peter are the ones who have the power to change doctrine, to change beliefs, and that they have the right to do so. And this is their whole claim, because they do not follow the Scriptures. If they followed the Scriptures, and if they only read what Peter said, they would come clean, and they would be online with you and me, because we believe the Bible. But they don't. And you'll notice, when they try to support this claim, I have right down the hall here, when this most recent Pope was being elected, I cut out of the St. Pete Times this chart of the so-called succession of the popes. You can go down the hall and look at it. It starts with Peter, and all of a sudden you have this big blank space up until the 6th century. Where are all these succeeding popes? They can't lay claim to anybody because there wasn't anybody. And the first guy you see coming along is at the end of the 500s or in the 6th century, Pope Gregory, the first real pope, it comes along that they may be, might be able to lay claim to in the succession of the popes. So they have about a 500-year gap where there ain't anybody. 
and there's no succession. How can they do it? That's a secular source. That's the St. Petersburg Times. I'm sure you know that they're not uh, really uh, uh, a religious newspaper, and they're just pointing out secular facts that you can find out in your newspaper or your encyclopedia just like anybody else. So the Roman Catholic Church as we know it did not really begin until the 6th century. And that's really when they began this thing. But they'd like to say that they can go right back to Peter and that the Pope is a succession uh, in the line of succession from Peter that he's following in the footsteps of Peter. That is not true. And, uh, of course, they say that because they say that since the church was built upon Peter, this power was passed on to every succeeding uh, leader, and therefore they have the authority to make the changes. This recent pope, what has he done? Recently he's gotten rid of limbo, hadn't he? Just decided to eliminate limbo. Are you reading the paper? Uh, they just make changes all the time. How can that be so? Truth is truth, and truth never changes. If limbo were ever truth, then how could limbo cease to exist? Because then you're saying truth ceases. That's not true. If truth is truth, truth exists forever. And truth will never change. Now that claim is made for the Bible. The Bible, Peter says, liveth and abideth forever. The word of God liveth and abideth forever. First Peter 1.25. And Peter tells us that we need to check out what the Bible says. Let's go now all the way over to First Peter and let's Peter, uh, let him talk for himself. Page 13.12. If you have the Schofield Bible, 1 Peter chapter 2, look if you will at verse 3. This is talking to us who have received God's grace by trusting Christ as our Savior. It says in verse 3, if so be, you have tasted that the Lord is what? Gracious. That means he's full of mercy. And the Bible tells us that he bestows his grace, his mercy, upon those who place their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. When you trust Christ, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, by grace are you saved through faith in Jesus Christ. So when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2, 8, God has grace or mercy upon you, and he says he saves you. This salvation, he goes on to say, is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest anyone should boast or brag. Well, here it says in Peter's letter here, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. We taste by trusting Christ as Savior. We partake of the death of Christ by faith, believing he died for us. And when we do, we partake and actually taste uh, what Christ did for us by receiving it. Verse 4, to whom coming as unto a living stone. So when we come to Christ in faith, we're coming to the foundation stone. Here Christ is described as a living stone. So when Christ said in Matthew 16, 16, that upon this rock I'll build my church, he's referring to himself, who is a living stone. And he says, Peter, you're just a little stone, a pebble, and you also are then built upon the foundation of myself, the rock. And you see that in verse 5 here. Let's continue on and you'll see it. You also as... Uh, well, let me go back to verse 4. I didn't finish it. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. So here we find that the stone that had been predicted in the Old Testament came and was rejected by the nation of Israel. And that's exactly what Peter said in his message in Acts 4. He said, the one that you have crucified, the one that God raised from the dead, that's the stone that by this man is made whole. And that is the one that neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12. But then it says in verse uh, 6 here, verse 5, you also as what? Living stones. We, all of us, when we trust Christ, become born again and become what the Bible describes here as living stones or pebbles and are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So we find the foundation stone is Christ and then each of us as believers are little stones built upon that foundation. 
And so I'm a stone in the building, and you're a stone in the building. It's one of the many pictures that God has of you and me as to our relationship to Christ. You become born again. You become a child of God. You trust Christ as Savior, and you become a stone in the building that is really the spiritual house that Christ indwells. He indwells every one of us as believers. Also, we become the body of Christ. And Christ is the head of that body. And we're members in that body. Uh, at the moment, we trust Christ and so on and so on. But this is one of those beautiful pictures. Then it says in verse 6, Wherefore also, and now here Peter quotes the Old Testament, as it is contained in the Scripture, this is in the Old Testament, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him. Peter could have very easily said, he that believeth on me. I'm the rock. I'm the one upon which the church is built. Peter doesn't say that. Peter says that this cornerstone that was rejected by Israel is precious, and he that believeth on him, not me, Peter says, but believeth on him, shall not be confounded. Once you believe on Christ, you'll never be confounded and wind up going to hell. But the lost are confounded, aren't they? In my earlier class, we were talking about how Christ was talking about those that don't have the light of the Word of God and the light of Christ walk in darkness. And isn't that true of every person that doesn't know Christ? As a little boy, growing up learning history, I learned about the dark ages in Europe. Me, being such a literalist from the very get-go, I thought it must have been some eclipse of the sun and Europe was in darkness. They didn't get much sunlight or a lot of clouds or a lot of smoke or something. Didn't realize it's talking about spiritual darkness. During the dark ages, Europe was in the clutches of the Roman Catholic Church. They kept everybody from the Word of God. They did not translate it into the language of the people. Latin became a, a, basically an uh, unused language. And so people were in spiritual darkness. And when the Reformation went, happened, what happened? Light came to the people. People began to read the Bible and see the light of God's Word. People came, as Martin Luther did, to trust Christ. And they became enlightened. And this was a time that everything just changed radically in Europe as this age of enlightenment came. And also became a time of setting free from the tentacles of the Roman Catholic Church and people began to study not only the Bible, but other things. And it was a truly an age of enlightenment. And look at all the things that were discovered about our universe and about everything as people began to, to look and search for answers and weren't told everything they could breathe and everything they could do had to be controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. That's really history. And it was a time of spiritual darkness. And light came as people got to see what the Word of God had to say. I remember... And Bush Garden still carries the theme, the dark continent of Africa. I thought, boy, Africa must be, you know, you have to bring flashlights when you go to Africa. So my little boy's impression, it's the dark continent. They don't have much light over there. I guess too much jungle or too much cloud cover or whatever it was. Didn't realize till later that that was a term applied by Christians because they didn't have the gospel. And there were so many tribal religions and beliefs, but not the word of God. And so they were in darkness and it was called the dark continent because they were in darkness. By the way, since then, the light of the gospel has come in the past several centuries, and today, for example, Kenya, Africa, sends more missionaries out to the world than any other country in the world. At one time, the United States was that country that sent missionaries out more than any other country in the world, but today we're hardly sending anybody anywhere. And Africa, some of those countries, are sending out missionaries to the world. We were just there in Israel in March, and we met wonderful people from Nigeria. And there they said they were watching and listening to Bible line. And they were wonderful Christian people, all excited about the Lord. And we thought, how wonderful that light has come to Africa. In many places, it's no longer the dark continent. They probably know more about Jesus than we do in our darkened America. But look at what's happened here. We're turning off the light in our courthouses. We're turning off the light in our schools. We're turning off the light in our businesses. We're turning off the light in our churches 
and America is going dark. And we'll be called the dark continent, I think, in the future because we are really in darkness, aren't we, today? Look at America stumbling. We can't seem to find our way because why? We have lost the light of the gospel of Christ. We've lost the light of God's word. And we're living in times that are perilous as we find that the Lord's coming is going to be soon. Well, this is Christ we're reading about here. He is the one that he that believeth on him. You might want to mark that phrase in verse 6 if you're marking your Bible. He that believeth on him, a common phrase in the New Testament, that's how you get saved. It says here, shall not be confounded. Verse 7, unto you therefore which what? Join the nearest church in your community, pay 20%, baptize three times. No, I made all that up. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. Obviously, he's talking about believing on Christ, to trust Him as your Savior. But unto them which be disobedient, that means disobedient in faith and not trusting Christ, the stone which the builders disallowed, not me, but Christ, the same is made the head of the corner. Peter is not talking about himself being the stone, but Christ himself being the stone. Look at the advice of Peter. If you'll turn to chapter 3, what does Peter say? Peter says in chapter 3 of 2 Peter, you have to go over one more book, but it's not a big one, not very long, three chapters. 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter says that I want you to follow the successors that follow me and follow their teachings and listen carefully to what they have to say because they will guide you into truth. Now, I made all that up. God forbid that that were true. 2 Peter chapter 3, notice what he says in verse 1. This second epistle, by the way, an epistle is not the wife of an apostle. The word epistle means letter. This is the, Peter's second letter. 2 Peter 3 verse 1 says, This second epistle, beloved, he's writing to us who are believers, I now write unto you in both my first epistle and my second, first and second Peter, I try to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Verse 2, what are we to be reminded of? What are we to remember? That you be mindful of the what? Words, W-O-R-D, that are spoken by the Pope. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I misread that too. That you might be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. You might put an O-T in the margin for Old Testament. The Old Testament came about by the prophets. We're to be paying attention to what God said in the Old Testament. Then he says of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, put an NT there to your right in the margin for New Testament. Peter is saying in this wonderful verse that we're to be mindful of what God has said through the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament, and what he has said through the apostles, the New Testament record, and that's where we're to look. That's where we're to go. We're not to follow any man-made teachings or traditions. Man does not have the authority at all. Back in 1 Peter 1, 23 and 25, he says, The word of God liveth and abideth forever. It's never going to be changed, never going to be altered. God is not going to revise it. Verse 3, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, what? Scoffers walking after their own lust. We're going to have people that will wind up denying the very basic principles of the Bible, the very basic teachings of the Bible, and this one here at the top of the list is where is his coming? The Roman Catholic Church does not teach that Christ is coming back again. They don't believe in the rapture. They believe that they have been set in charge to bring peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's what the Crusades were all about. Take armies out, conquer the world for Christ, and become uh, the, the world religion. And that desire has always been there within that church. That's not God's plan. Christ will come back and literally bring about peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Catholic doctrine is not consistent with the Bible. Catholics don't believe in the rapture. Why? It conflicts with their other major doctrines. We believe, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.8, absent from the body, present with the Lord. At death, you go absent from this body, immediately present with the Lord. Guess what the Roman Catholic Church? They'd have to revise everything. Absent from the body, present in purgatory. 
They teach every Roman Catholic at death goes to purgatory, probably will stay there 100,000 years at least, working off their sins that they didn't get paid for here by their works, and working them off, hopefully eventually to be delivered from the flames of purgatory, to wind up in heaven. It's just not true. I've done many funerals where I've shared it with a Roman Catholic priest. When I get there, I usually get there early and I say, you go first, I'll go last. I let him go first and then I go last. And uh, I remember one, he was talking about purgatory and praying for the loved one to get out of purgatory. I went up and said, there is no such thing as purgatory. I knew this lady, I led her to Christ and she's in heaven. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I didn't know if I'd walk out of that place alive, but I did. But I, I said, we have to tell the truth. And unfortunately, a lot of people are told something that's just not true at all. And when you think about the doctrines that man makes, they all wind up in some way or another conflicting and contradicting what God has said in His Word. If there is a purgatory and you have to go there first, there can be no rapture, can there? How can you be absent from the body, present with the Lord? Or how can you be alive and caught up to meet the Lord in the air when the Lord says, I'm sorry, you can't come up now. You've got to go to purgatory for 100,000 years, and eventually we'll call you up when we get around to it if you endure it and work off those sins. That's just amazingly wrong, and yet this is what is being taught. I just felt this was not the message I wanted to do today. I felt compelled to, to say it in our world when people are getting mixed up, and this is what the claim is, that the one true church is the Roman Catholic Church. Did you read it? It was Tuesday's headlines. And uh, that all other churches are defective or false. There's only one true church on the planet, and they claim it's the Roman Catholic Church. That is not true. And the Roman Catholic Church, as we know it, didn't even really exist till the 6th century. Go down and look at the succession of the popes. You've got five centuries of blank, blank space, blank air. Try to follow it. There is no papal succession. There is no... Uh, authority given in that way. And if you know this, you're able to answer because every Roman Catholic will say, our church is built upon Peter. Peter was the first pope. And therefore, our church is the true church and we have this succession. You have to say, not true. Jesus never said that. And you, hopefully today, will know that Christ himself is that stone. That's abundantly clear. Peter himself declared it. Peter never said, I'm the stone. He always said, he is the stone. And if you believe on him, you'll be saved. And neither is there salvation in any other. Jesus is the only Savior. And Peter tells us to be mindful of what the Scripture teaches. He knew through God the Holy Spirit, writing the Bible through him, that we needed to go back to this book. And do you know what? Many major churches on this planet hate the letters of Peter. They want them thrown out of the Bible. They want to get rid of them. Why? Because Peter tells the truth and says, you need to pay attention to this Bible. And they don't want you to pay attention to the Bible. They don't want you to listen to the Word of God. They don't want you to read this book. And nor does Satan. Did you know that? And how good he is at keeping people away from the Bible. I have people telling me all the time, have you read this book? Have you read that book? Ah, I got the latest book. And you do. Oh, and they tell you all the books that they've read, and you ask them, have you read your Bible lately? Well, no. This is the best book. This is the final book. This is the book you have to look at. And if you're reading other books, at least give the Bible more time than the other books you're reading. Because there's a danger in reading too many other books, too many other sources. You need to go to God's Word. That is the final authority. So I hope you're reading this book. This is the book that we ought to be in, all of us. Knowing what it says. Being able to recite chapter and verse. Here's what it says and here's where it says it. And show me to those who would make other claims. Show me in your Bible. And they generally cannot do it. They generally don't have a clue as to what is within this book. That's where we need to be. Let me illustrate, if I might, because we have run out of time. And again, I want to welcome all of our Internet audience. I don't know how many we have today, but last week... We had a record audience, and uh, 
people are tuning in from all over. So we have a, an audience much larger than what's right here in this room watching this worship service right now live. And then in addition, we're not even counting the ones that watch it throughout the week. There are hundreds of people that watch this service throughout the week in addition to the hundreds watching right this very moment. And we want to welcome all of you that are watching. I want you to look up here as we close the service. I want you to notice here as I let this hand represent all of us and my hymnal representing sin, we're all sinners. God loves us. He hates our sin. He wants us to enter heaven, but no sin can exist in the presence of God. If you had to pay for any of your sins, you'd have to pay for it in hell. Not even a lie would be allowed in heaven if you told just one lie in your whole lifetime that would be enough to condemn you to hell. That was a shock to me when I first heard that and made me panic. I told about four lies at a time. That's, that's not true either. But God loves us, hates our sin, wants us to enter heaven, but our sins have to be paid for. If we paid for them, there's only one payment. The wages of sin is death, which ultimately means to be cast into hell, according to Revelation 20. What we need is a Savior, my other hand representing Christ. He is that Savior, sinless, perfect God who took on flesh. I'm going to let this clean piece of paper represent His righteousness. To enter heaven, according to the Bible, you have to be as righteous as Christ. We're not. Here we are with sin. Here's Christ with no sin. What happened at the cross was that God made an exchange. Our sins were taken by God and laid upon Christ, and He paid for them by His death. And he was buried, and then he came back again from the dead. When we trust that he died there for you or for me, when you trust that he died for you, then an exchange is made, and God credits your account with his righteousness. I'm going to heaven not because of any good deed that I have done. I'm going to heaven because of what God did for me, that he took my sins, all of them, past, present, and future, paid for them in their entirety, and has credited my account with his righteousness. Anything short of the righteousness of God will not allow you into heaven. Only by trusting Christ can you have that righteousness credited to you. And only believers will enter heaven. All others will not make it. And it's important for us, I think, to realize that. Wow. A lot of people are going to die and all of a sudden wake up in a place they wish they'd never been and never uh, had gone when they didn't have to go because Christ had paid for their sin. If they'd only had received Christ, they could have gone to heaven. Let's bow in prayer. With heads bowed and with eyes closed and with no one looking my, around, my friend, where would you go if you were to die? You might have come today as a visitor. You might be watching on the Internet right now and have never really understood this plan of salvation. This is the most important part of the message. It's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. If you haven't been certain about where you'd spend eternity, chances are maybe you'd never understood the plan of salvation until perhaps right now. Right now, you could talk to the living God in the quietness of your mind. He knows your thoughts. You could tell him, God, I'm a sinner. And we all are. But God, right here and now, I trust Jesus Christ as the one who died in my place, paying for my sins by his death and that he was buried and rose again from the dead, and he's alive forevermore. I trust Jesus right now to save me, to forgive me, to give me the gift of everlasting life. And the moment you do, God up in heaven knows, and he saves you. If you're looking for a feeling, don't. Feelings are up and down. They're not reliable. God has given us his word. He's never going to change his word. We just talked about that several times. Peter says it lives and abides forever. We're to go back and be reminded of what God has said, which will never change. He's not going to trick you, mislead you, deceive you. If you believe what God said, that settles it. It's done forever. God said it. You believe it. That settles it. It's a done deal. You can be assured of going to heaven. Then, yes, if you live for Christ, He'll reward you and bless you. There are degrees of reward in heaven and degrees of blessing in this life and in eternity based upon our service. 
but eternal life is a gift received solely by trusting Christ as Savior. If you haven't prayed that prayer, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I trust Jesus right now to save me. I believe he died and shed his blood as the payment for my sin. And I trust him right now to be my Savior. Now, if you did that, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm going to do this on purpose so that no one will be embarrassed. We're not going to have anybody forward. We're not going to single anyone out. No one's going to come running up and grab you by the shoulder. No one will even know. I'm going to be the only one looking in this whole room. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer and accepted Christ as your Savior, I'd like to conclude the service by including you in this closing prayer. And uh, we're not going to embarrass you or put you on the spot in any way. I'm going to close in prayer and then we'll be dismissed. But if you prayed that prayer just now, this morning, while none are looking except for me, would you lift up your hand where I can see it and put it right back on? God bless you. Yes, I see your hand. Or the other. Sometimes it's difficult to see. You can put that hand down. Anybody else? I trusted Christ this morning as my Savior. I'd like you to pray for me. Slip up your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. Yes. Anybody else? I trusted Jesus Christ this morning as my Savior. Slip it up and put it down. Anyone else before we close? Anyone else? You don't have to raise your hand to be saved. When you trust Christ, God up in heaven knows, and He saves all those that put their trust in Him. Those of you on watching on the Internet, where you are right now, you could whisper the same prayer and trust Christ, and God saves you. And He knows the moment you do, and you're forever His from that moment on. God bless each one of these that raised their hand this morning. We thank you for them and for the fact that they have received eternal life right here in our presence by trusting Jesus as their Savior and the finished work that he accomplished for us on the cross. We pray, Lord, that you just would give us a vision of what can be done, how we can reach a world out there with this wonderful message in the remaining hours. We don't know, but that you could come this year. We don't know as the Middle uh, East right now seems to be coming to a boiling point. Things are happening in our world that are incredibly uh, disturbing. Uh, we know that it doesn't appear that peace is on the horizon, but nothing but war and, and weapons of mass destruction and perhaps even our country being attacked by Al-Qaeda or other terrorist groups even before the summer is out, according to the head of Homeland Security here in the U.S. Lord, we pray that we might realize these are hours when we as Christians need to get on the ball and give out this message to at least our family members and friends and those that we really care about that we wouldn't let them perish or be left behind should the rapture happen. We ask you to bless our dinner that will follow in the back building in just a moment and uh, our church and the new class will offer this Tuesday night, the vacation Bible school that will begin a week from tomorrow and all the other things that's, that are happening here at Calvary including our, our message going out throughout the week all over the world. And we ask you to bless now in Jesus' name. Amen.